Hello? It's me. It's Rocky. We're gonna go to Mr. Ballin today, and we're gonna check out what he has to offer. And to be honest, there is so much things going on in that channel, it's amazing. I wish I could do like every one of them. Uh, so I picked one that wasn't like uh, 48 minutes long. Let me know if you actually would actually like watch my reactions to Mr. Ballin if my video is about an hour long. I don't know if I want to watch myself do that for one hour. Let me know. You can always uh, smack like, of course, and hit that subscribe. I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, before we watch the video, uh, it's 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 not one of one of the long ones. I actually found someone that was uh, fifteen minutes long, and this one is the girl. This girl is about to live a nightmare. Don't know what it is. Of course, that actually got me intrigued and interested. So that's always a good thing. So before we watch the video, as per usual, we thank the awesome people, the incredible, cool people that actually supports me. Just uh, a bit of extra. We got the channel members. You guys rock. Thank you so much, guys. And of course, we have the Patreon. This is the best list known to man, to be honest. And we're going to have to mention the Supreme Tier Donators over by Patreon. They get a shout out. It's David Bankson, Buddha Squirrel, Southern Mom, Fran, and Deja Kiera. I really hope I pronounced that last name correctly. I mean, I have done it like four or five times now, so I think it's pretty cool. So let's watch this cool thing. Today's story has two significant plot twists, and one of them comes at the very end. So mm -hmm. make sure you stick around to hear the entire story. Cool. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to detail the like button's car, but as soon as they give you their keys, just fill their car up with an angry pack of Asian murder hornets. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into murder today's hornets. story. <coughs> let's do this. The secret. Right in the middle of the United States is a quiet little town called Milstadt, Illinois. Milstadt is home to about 4,000 people, and had it not been for Ashley Reeves, only those 4,000 people and their friends and family would even know that Milstadt existed. In 2006, Ashley Reeves was a 17-year-old high school student who lived with her parents and her younger sister Casey in okay. Milstadt. Ashley was an excellent student who, even though she was over a year from her high school graduation, she was already thinking about what colleges she wanted to go to. She was sense. also extremely likable and outgoing, and she had this huge infectious smile. And so she had tons of friends, and she had a very serious boyfriend who her parents adored. His name was Jeremy, and he was a high school student as well. On the morning of Thursday, April 27th of that year, Ash I feel like it's going to be really eerie. He's really good at this. <laughs> Just gonna say that. We got up, and like every other morning, she got ready for school alongside her sister Casey. And then, right before Ashley stepped out to head off to school, she told her parents that after school, she had a job interview on the other side of town. And then, after her interview, her plan was to play basketball with some friends and then she'd be home. And so, her parents said, Okay, well, hey, good luck with your job interview and just make sure you're home before 10 30 p.m. And so, Ashley said, No problem, I'll see you tonight. And then she left. That afternoon, after school, Ashley made her way to Jeremy's locker, and when she got to him, Jeremy handed her his keys to his car. He had an SUV, and he was lending it to her for the day so she could go to the interview and then go play basketball. Okay. And so Ashley took the keys, she thanked him, she gave him a hug, and then she turned and she walked down the hallway where she met up with her sister, Casey, at her locker, and then the two girls left the school, they went out to the student parking lot, they found Jeremy's Is SUV, they hopped inside, and then Ashley began driving them back to their house. When they got there, Casey hopped out of the car, 
she said bye to Ashley, and then Ashley left their house and she began driving to Fairview Heights, which was a town about 15 miles away where her interview was going to be. Several hours later, around 10 p.m., Ashley's parents had not heard from their daughter and it was getting close to her curfew, and so they asked Casey if she had spoken with Ashley and, you know, did she know how her interview went? Did she know when she was going to be home? But Casey would tell them, actually, no, I haven't talked to Ashley since she dropped me off from school. And so Ashley's parents said, okay, no big deal. And they called Ashley, but Ashley didn't pick up. So they sent her a series of text messages. But after a couple of minutes of not getting any response, they decided to just call her boyfriend, Jeremy, to see if maybe he knew what was going on with Ashley. But when they spoke to Jeremy, he would say that, you know, I haven't spoken with Ashley since I gave her the keys to my SUV. And I've actually been trying to talk to her all day. I've been calling her and texting her, but I still haven't heard back. And this is going to go really, really south. So at this point, Ashley's parents were starting really to get really south. worried. And so after hanging up with Jeremy, they began calling other friends of Ashley's mm -hmm. to see if maybe they had spoken to her and knew what was going on. But all of her friends that they spoke to all had the same story. We haven't talked to her since the end of school and she's not returning our calls or texts. And so Ashley's mother, she just sensed that something was terribly wrong. Yeah. And so without any hesitation, she just called the police. Now, the police in this town were used to getting calls every now and again from parents whose teenage child had run off and they were concerned about them. But virtually every time the police investigated, they would find the teenager had just kind of been blowing off their friends and family and they would pop up maybe a couple hours later, totally unharmed. But the Milstadt police would later remark when they heard Ashley's mother's voice over the phone, the fear in her voice was so pronounced, it immediately pushed the police department to take this case very seriously. I mean, I understand that law enforcement just shrugs a bit over a missing person, especially if the missing person is like, gets to be missing on the same day as they actually call it in. I would definitely agree with the police that we got to wait. We don't know what's going on. Maybe just uh, going somewhere, just like he said, blowing off parents and friends. But I think you have to have the intuition or the gut, the feeling you have in your gut when something is not correct, something is wrong, and the voice of a of a mama of the mother's like really profound concern, I would definitely go by that too. And so that night, right after this phone call, the Milstadt Police Department went out in force to try to locate Jeremy's SUV, the car that Ashley had been driving around that day. And the first place they went to to look for this car was Ladderman Park, which is this very popular public park that has a really popular basketball court that lots of teenagers would go to all the time. And Ashley was known to frequent that park. And this park was located about halfway between Fairview Heights, where her interview was, mm -hmm. and Milstadt, where she lived. And so they go to Latterman Park, and right away, sitting in the parking lot, they find Jeremy's SUV. But Ashley is not in the car. She's nowhere near the car. And when they searched the car, there was nothing of significance inside of it. There was just some of Ashley's clothes lying around. The police would spend all night and well into the morning combing Latterman Park, looking for any sign of Ashley, but there wasn't one. And so as the sun came up and the police were nowhere closer to finding this girl, they began to suspect that, you know, perhaps foul play was involved <clears throat> that's what i'm thinking about as a law enforcement officer you gotta make that call i would love to be a cop though i would love to be a cop uh it's kind of hard for me to really get that feeling like what's going on uh see when it's when it's getting serious i mean i don't i don't live in the united states I'm pretty sure that's like a, a bunch of people calling in missing friends and missing family on a regular basis. It happens, it happens in Sweden too, but it's not that often. We've got missing people here in Sweden. Uh, sometimes you see on Facebook, some, some individual disappeared, haven't seen them since. Often it's like a few days, maybe up to a week. Uh, I don't know how the, uh, like the law or like the SOP, whatever you want to call it in Sweden, if when they actually start looking for someone that is reported missing. I don't know, how much is it in the United States? 
is it like a limit do they have to wait like uh one day three days i feel i, I think i heard a couple of years ago that they had that they normally wait like two or three days but that seems really excessive though and so the first person they hauled in for questioning was Ashley's boyfriend, Jeremy. But as soon as he sat in the interrogation room, he demonstrated a real concern for Ashley. He had a rock solid alibi and he basically was an open book. And so they quickly ruled him out as a suspect. And then the police basically began hauling in all of Ashley's friends and acquaintances and family members, basically anybody that knew her. They were bringing them into the station to find out if they knew anything that could help them figure out where Ashley was. And more more specifically, the police were really looking to see if any of these people were hiding something. And sure enough, a few of the friends that were brought in were. According what? to a few of Ashley's closest friends, Ashley was in not one, but two romantic relationships. One was the public relationship she had with Jeremy, and the other was a secret relationship that was actually illegal. In order to hide this forbidden second relationship, Ashley would tell her family and her friends that she was going to the park to play basketball, when in reality, she was going to the park to meet up with this secret second partner. And the day before when- So when, he's, when he said he's illegal is, how old is she? She's like 15 years old. And so I'm betting that the individual she is meeting up is like super, like more like 30, 40. And that should be illegal. That is illegal too. Even in Sweden, that's illegal. When Ashley went missing, her friends told police that that was the exact reason she was going to Latterman Park. The police got the name of this secret person from Ashley's friends. His name was Sam Shelton, and the police tracked him down. When they found him, he was at a baseball practice, but the police didn't care. They marched right onto the baseball diamond, and they grabbed Sam, and they brought him back to the police station. And then when he got there, they sat him down in the interrogation room, and he's still wearing his baseball uniform, and they ask him about his relationship with Ashley. And he immediately denies it and says he does not have a relationship with Ashley. He's got no idea why he's here. But pretty quickly, after a few questions, Sam's answers became inconsistent, and so the police just ratcheted up the pressure on him and then finally after 12 hours of questioning wait a minute are you t 12 hours 12 hours yeah well he already did a crime no even even if he didn't do anything with her at this time uh he did a crime so that kind of makes sense that he wouldn't talk about it. The interrogator brings up Sam's mother and his grandmother, and he says to Sam, you know, how would they feel if they knew you were lying to the police right now? And this just broke Sam. And so he cracked. Now, at this point, the police were already expecting the worst when it came to Ashley, but they were not ready for just how brutal Sam's confession would be about what exactly he did to her. The fall <sighs> What he did to her? following is an account based on his confession. 30 hours earlier, Ashley wrapped up her interview in Fairview Heights, and she made her way to Latterman Park to meet up with Sam. And now it's not clear exactly how they met up, but eventually the two of them did connect and they made their way over to Sam's car where they became intimate. Afterwards, the two are sitting in the front two seats of Sam's car. Sam is in the driver's seat and Ashley is in the passenger seat. And while they're sitting there, something happens that causes this huge fight between the two of them and at some point sam tells ashley to get out of the car but ashley refuses she wants to talk to him she wants to deal with their issues but sam's not having it and so he gets so mad at her that he lunges across the center console of the car and he puts ashley into a vicious chokehold now he tells police his plan was to kind of yank her out of the car but he squeezed so hard around her neck that he heard this loud popping sound coming from her neck it was the sound of her neck breaking. And so as soon as he heard it, Sam let go and Ashley kind of crumpled forward and hit the front dashboard of the car. And so Sam is staring at her, wondering what he should do. He's kind of looking around, making sure no one saw what he just did. And then he reached over and lifted her back up to see if she was still alive. And he saw she was. But instead of trying to get her help, he decides right then and there, he's going to kill her. And so he reaches over and he begins choking her. But after several minutes of throttling her, she just wouldn't die. And so Sam pulled his belt off of his waist and he wrapped it around Ashley's neck. And then he began pulling. 
I mean, I mean, it's just an insane thing to do. I mean, okay, so he decides to have a relationship with an underage uh, girl, and there was a dispute in the car, and he wanted her to get out, uh, and I'm 100% sure he had some kind of a regret of actually having uh, relations with an underage girl, and they had a, a fallout, and he told her, her to leave, get out of the car. She didn't want to. She wanted, like, resolve whatever it was. And he responds by taking a neck hold, choke hold. And he had a lot of rage in him to be able to actually not have a sense of a limit. So he snaps her neck. She's probably... Not 100% sure that she is uh, paralyzed after that one. She could definitely be. But he responds to this situation is to strangle her and try to kill her. I mean, how messed up are you in your, in your freaking head? But he would tell police he couldn't stand looking at Ashley's face while he did this. He said she was staring right at him, her tongue was coming out of her mouth, she was frothing, and her face was turning this ghastly shade of gray-blue. And so at some point, when she still hadn't died, he released the belt from around her neck, and he turned her body so she was facing the window away from him, and then he repositioned the belt on her neck, and then he put his foot on her back to use as leverage, and then he pulled as hard as he possibly could on her throat for quite a while until the belt actually broke around her neck. And then at that point, he checked to make sure she was dead. And when she was, he stuffed her down into the floorboards in front of the passenger seat. And then he drove several miles across town to another park called Citizens Park that was very heavily forested. And once he parked in the parking lot, he looked around to make sure no one was watching. And then he dragged Ashley's body out of the car and deep into the woods. She's not dead where he abandoned her. It would turn out Ashley was far from the only teenage girl who found Sam Shelton attractive. Many teenage girls in the area thought he was the perfect catch. He was smart, he was handsome, and he had these beautiful, striking... He is a psycho? blue eyes that you couldn't help but just stare at. However, there was something unique about Sam that made him fundamentally different than all the other guys at their schools. Sam was not a student. He was a 27-year-old middle school teacher in Milstadt, and he also was the high school baseball coach. He had never been Ashley's teacher directly. However, years earlier when she was in middle school, he had begun grooming her for exploitation. And so fast forward to 2006 when she was seven he had effectively manipulated her into believing Still illegal. she was in this romantic relationship with him, when in reality, he was just using his position of power to abuse her. In addition to being a school teacher, Sam was also an aspiring pro wrestler. He would often compete in local showcases under the nickname The Teacher. While Sam was probably nowhere near good enough to actually become a professional wrestler like you would see on TV, he was extremely strong and really knew how to do a choke Hold. And so when he attacked Ashley and put her in that vicious chokehold, she had no chance at escaping. She was completely doomed. Shortly after his confession, Sam would tell the police that he would take them out into the forest of Citizens Park to try to find Ashley's body. But when they got there, it was late, it had been raining for several hours, and Sam right away acted like he couldn't figure out exactly where he had left her. And so the police were actually starting to think, you know, is he lying to us? Is this whole thing just kind of made up? Did he really attack her? Is she really out here? But after about 30 minutes of the police and Sam kind of trudging around the thick forest, one of the officers suddenly sees something on the ground. He raises his flashlight, and there in a clearing is Ashley's body. And so the police and Sam, they walk over to her, and they're standing above her ruined She's not body. dead, her though. Her neck is totally bent at a grotesque angle. She's covered in bugs. But as they're standing there and they're watching her, her chest suddenly starts to move. She wasn't dead. She had been left for dead, and she had been out in the woods with a broken neck for Poor 30 girl, hours. Poor girl, what the hell? The rain. She only had a t-shirt and some pants on, but she was alive. And so moments later, the paramedics, they come rushing into the forest. They pick her up really gently. They bring her out and they rush her to the hospital where she'd be put into a medically induced coma. The doctors would tell her family that unfortunately her injuries were just too serious and we don't expect her to ever wake up again. 
But miraculously, she would. Wow. She would have to relearn how to walk and talk and eat and drink, but she would do all of those things. And today she is 32 years old. She is happily married. She has two kids of her own. And by and large, she leads a very happy, normal life. As for Sam Shelton, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for attempted murder, and he's still in prison today. However, he is up for parole in 2024. So that's going to do it. Wow. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to detail the like button's car. But as soon as they give you the keys, just fill their car up with an angry pack of Asian murder hornets. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on. Already dead, my dude. Okay. I've seen a bunch of different uh, videos like this. I mean, I'm a huge fan of watching netflix series about like serial killers and stuff like that i just saw uh john wayne gacy who was a complete psycho as well and she survived and how the hell did she do that i'm 100 percent sure the lord watches over her in a way that he is not doing for everyone else god bless her and Hope that dude freaking stays in jail forever. He's up for parole in 2024. I don't like parole. I do not like him one bit. I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really like Mr. Ball. And if there's any, any suggestion to any of his videos they want me to react to, please tell me in the comment section. And if you want to join the awesome people, hit join or the awesome link in the description to everything that is recce, or it's a Patreon link in the comment section. Until next time, stay safe.